This FedGov Today program is sponsored by SINAC. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the solution to avoiding a cookie-cutter approach to authorities to operate. Looking at your environment, taking it for the uniqueness that it is, and then working with it um, and in consideration of it to kind of build that ATO or CATO process. Dina Soleil on FedGov Today in just a moment. The Army will add more programs to the three that currently have continuous authorities to operate. The CIO of the Army, Leo Garcia, tells FedGov today it's taken about two years to refine the CATO process. Dina Saleh is Federal Solutions Architect at SINAC. Dina, welcome. It's great to have you on the program. What difference have you seen the continuous authority to operate concept make for security across federal agencies? Welcome. Hi, Francis. Pleasure to be here. Um, I think that's a great question. I think the most significant difference that I've seen just by, you know, being boots on the ground and talking to people and having these conversations is I think it's getting people excited again. I think it's it's preventing people from falling into that kind of, uh, you know, I like to call it that endless death loop of kind of being inundated with that process of the, you know, original ATO process that, you know, was a pain for anyone that was going through it. Um, for those folks that haven't gone through it, count yourself lucky. You <laughs> save yourself a few gray hairs. But it was it was definitely one of those really, you know, fatigue heavy processes. And now with um, continuous uh, ATO, basically where we're doing that whole that whole concept of very static, one dimensional, old school procedures and processes. And so because we're now focusing on continuously monitoring, continuously testing and continuously updating, um, it's it's a lot, it's going to be a lot more efficient and we don't have to wait for every couple of years to go ahead and test our um, our solutions and our softwares to make sure they're they're remaining compliant and they're also remaining secure. You used that fatigue word before we went on the air when we were talking in the warm up. And I think that's a really interesting way to describe the way a lot of folks have thought about not just the security process, but the overall software development process in general inside the federal government. What's driving that? And what are the potential solutions above and beyond the continuous authority to operate process? Well, I think, again, the fatigue comes from that continuous kind of process, right? It does mean nonstop. It means that you're you know, you're collecting vulnerability data and scanning results and checking log reports 24-7. Um, and that also means that your teams have to manage that, right? So they're usually, you know, the same ones that are trying to keep systems online. They're, you know, not only drowning in dashboards, they're fighting tool sprawl. And half the time, you know, the, the systems they're monitoring weren't even built for this kind of visibility. Like, again, especially with legacy systems. I think that fatigue just feels incredibly overwhelming, and then a lot of times they're inundated with just overwhelming data uh, and it's like they're drowning in it. And I think that's where Synac comes in because I like to think of Synac and I always tell, you know, my, my customers that it's kind of like we're the cheat sheet for the exam. Right. So, you know, you guys have got like pages and pages of security data, of scans, findings and alerts. And then we come in, we're going to strip all that down for you and actually focus on what matters. So we're going to show you, you know, like which questions are going to be on the test, which answers count and then which ones you can actually ignore. So instead of spending those countless hours buried in every single you know, line of vulnerability data and reports, you're gonna get the right stuff that's truly exploitable, it's verifiable, and that needs attention now. Um, and I think the biggest difference is we really focus on not just giving you data, but providing direction or giving you direction. The, it sounds too like having all of that information is helpful and not helpful at the same time, both in knowing what you have and knowing how secure you are, but also in meeting whatever the compliance rules are that you have to, uh, whatever those marks are that you have to hit. Definitely. No, that's that's 100% true. And I think that's that's what everyone's trying to figure out, right? So again, with continuous authorized to operate, I think it looks great on paper, again, because you are continuously testing, you know, you have faster ATOs, you have more agility. It sounds simple in theory, but in reality, I don't see that, you know, usually being the case because, you know, most places still treat it like a one-year thing. So I see teams, you know, pulling all-nighters before an assessment. You know, those folks are scrambling to check, uh, you know, to, to check boxes. And then after that, it's crickets, right? Until the next cycle. And that's not necessarily continuous that's just that's just louder compliance yeah um and, and that's the real problem is is, is it's bandwidth right people are going to be people are likely burned out uh security teams are you know juggling audits they're they're patching they're they're you know ticketing queues and they're also trying to keep the lights on so you can't have true 
you know, continuous if you're still chasing spreadsheets and firefighting every day. Um, it's just like a classic trap that I see a lot of folks fall into. What is the role for artificial intelligence to automate some of that ongoing data collection, data analysis, and then application? Definitely. So again, and I'm sure everyone has said this, that AI is the shiny new thing right now, right? So no doubt it's definitely useful. However, it is not a silver bullet, right? You can't just slap AI on top of compliance or on top of a compliance stack and then call it continuous. And I've seen that happen more times than not, unfortunately. Um, I think AI, you know, I think of it as like an intern who never sleeps. So yes, it's going to be doing the heavy lifting, the repetitive, boring, cumbersome stuff so that humans can actually come in and focus on that nuance to work, that nuance to work. Um, and again, from a Synac perspective, we use AI and automation to, you know, surface those issues quickly, but we still put a human um, uh, in, in the loop um, to be a part of the process. So that way we have a human coming in and deciding what is real, uh, if it's able to be chained um, and if it matters. Otherwise, it's just going to be a lot of noise and not insight. What are the obstacles that you've seen organizations in the government run into when they've tried to implement a CATO process? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, uh, you know, apart from the whole compliance aspect of it, I feel like, um, you know, it's that a lot of their data is static. It's very one dimensional. And, and again, the reason for this is because your tools and those that, that automation process, it only knows what it knows, right? It's only going to look at a vulnerability and be like, is this exploitable? Yes or no. As a human, I bring in that insight. And again, so I, I was a former pen tester at DHS for a few years. I can look at a vulnerability and be like, you know what? It's going to take me a couple hops to make this exploitable. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the, the biggest issues is because, you know, that human intuition really kind of is necessary to kind of close that security gap that a lot of um, organizations are falling into. You mentioned AI is not a silver bullet. Are there people that are still approaching it like it is in the security space? Very much so. Very much so. It's kind of like um, I actually had a general at, at one of the conferences tell me, like, I hate the word modernization. I hate the <laughs> word AI because, or in, in uh, zero trust because people just use this as a fancy word and they slap that on. They're like, hey, we're, you know, we're zero trust or we're using AI. And they think that's like a, a cure for all. And if anything, it, it buys them a peace of mind but it doesn't take care of the issue. And then when something does happen, when something does break or, uh, you know, a, a system is infiltrated, that's when they're like, you know, wait, how did I know AI is working? Or how do I even validate that my zero trust is effective? Um, that is an, another loophole that I see a lot of uh, industries fall into is they're assuming um, kind of blindly that these are effective and these are just go-to methods without actually testing it um, and doing their, their their due diligence. Six or eight years ago, I was at a big uh, IT conference for the federal government, and I made a joke on stage that I wish that I had a concession that made little stickers for people to stick the word cloud on their business cards, and I would make more money than anybody in the joint. And everybody <laughs> laughed, and then everybody at the same time kind of went, oh, like they realized all of a sudden it wasn't quite that funny. And that's my sense of where we are right now with artificial intelligence. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I think it, like I said, it, it looks and it sounds nice, but I think um, actually putting it to the test, I don't see people doing that. And I think that's, that's kind of where environments tend to fall apart and security stacks tend, uh, tend to crumble. So. Is there a blueprint or a, a list of best practices for establishing a successful CATO process inside an agency? It, I mentioned the Army at the beginning of our conversation that seems to be having some success in replicating it. Okay, we got one. Now we got three. Uh, Leo says they're going to get more and so on. It sounds like they've kind of cracked the code to some degree. Is that something that's replicable across agencies or does everybody have to kind of figure it out on their own based on <laughs> their infrastructure or their mission or whatever? That's, that's, that's kind of the issue is it's so easy to kind of look at it from a very cookie cutter approach. Um, and, and personally, in my experience, looking at it that way, it gets rid of the uniqueness that every single environment, every single you know agency has within the federal space. Um, and, and I think looking at it objectively is not always the way to go because again, people have different processes, there's things that are updating different systems in place. Um, and so 
I, I think that is probably one of the biggest cruxes if you're looking at it from a one size fits all perspective. Um, I think looking at your environment, taking it for the unique, uh, the uniqueness that it is, and then working with it um, and in consideration of it to kind of build that ATO or CATO process. Um, for example, like one customer, one DOD customer in particular sticks out. Um, you know, they've been dragging towards, you know, you know, CATO forever. Like they have tons of systems, they have lots of manual work. And like I said before, their people were totally fatigued. But again, we kind of came in, we scaled the testing. So it was able to run, um, you know, continuously across all their environments. And then the automation uh, perspective came in and we kind of handled coverage. So it was great. And then our researchers kind of further came in and then validated everything. So we reduced time because we're cutting out, um, you know, false positives. And so we're able to kind of produce a clean evidence of all their security packages. Um, and, you know, it ended up being effective and very successful and a very, very easy process, uh, as easy as it could as it could be. Yeah. So. Is there a foundation that an agency should have from an infrastructure perspective or a governance perspective or any of that to be able to get off on the right foot when it starts into something like this? Correct. But again, keep in mind that it is all so fluid right now, just even given what the Again, certain compliance checks, all these mandates that are coming out, it's it's so difficult to kind of look at it and just be like, I need to do these three things for me to kind of be on the road to becoming Cato ready. But it, it, it is it does require a lot more nuance. It, instead of painting with a broad brush, you do need to go and become a little bit more narrow and just look at everything specifically to that to that agency. Dina, it's great to have you on the show. I appreciate your time today. Thank you pleasure. Thank you so much. You can read more about continuous ATOs on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. Coming next on the FedGov Today podcast, avoiding shutdown surprises. The former CIO of the FBI, Gordon Bitco, will tell you how tomorrow. If you don't want to miss that, you can follow the FedGov Today podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on the FedGov Today YouTube channel, or on demand at fedgovtoday.com. I'm Francis Rose. I'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening. 